Hello, welcome to the 1874 show. I'm your host, Dan Bardell, joined by Greg Evans, who's joined us on holiday for this emergency cobbled together podcast. So Greg's got no mic. Internet could be a bit sketchy, but we just wanted to try and put a show out. Greg, how are you? Hello, Dan. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. We've had a, a good day on the beach uh, down in Bournemouth with me and my heavily pregnant wife. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did say I wouldn't be doing any work this week, but obviously when news like that news like Christian Perslow, the, one of the most important p- uh, people at Aston Villa, is announced to be leaving on the morning of the, um, one of your holiday days, you've just got to get into action, haven't you, and work. So. <laughs> to be honest, you haven't been on the beach, have you? You've been on the beat. That's what I actually thought you were going to... Uh, that's actually what I thought you were going to say then, that you were, you, yeah. you were on the beat. Just, yeah, I mean, fair play to you. It's a terrible time for you, for you to be going away and then and this has happened. But it was huge news this morning. I don't think it was a great surprise. In, in, in some ways, it felt like over the last few weeks that this was the way it was going to go. You've done a, done a kind of a, a long read on The Athletic that, that's come out this morning going over the last five years and, and why this has happened. So for those that won't have read the piece, do you want to just go into a little bit of detail over, over what you've written this morning? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'd, I'd obviously encourage people who, who aren't subscribed to The Athletic to go and have a read of it because everything that we, we cover on the podcast here um, you know, won't cover all of that. Um, the, the article is in a lot more detail. But in, in short, you know, Christian Perslow has left Aston Villa, as we know now. Um, it's been something that we've been hearing for, for the last couple of weeks. There have been some whispers that um, his role had become slightly diminished. Um, because, but basically because of Unai Emery becoming much more powerful at the club. Um, Nassif Sawiris, one of the co-owners, taking on a little bit more responsibility uh, himself um, and almost a change in style in, term of, in terms of the, the, the management sort of model at Villa uh, before, you know, for the last five years, Perslow has been um, sort of in charge of all departments overseeing everything, basically, you know, from the, the men's first team through to the women's team, through to the academy, uh, through to the stadium rebuild. Um, uh, in a commercial department, et cetera, et cetera. But when Emery came in in November, it was clear that he was now making the footballing decisions um, alongside uh, Damir Vidigani, his, his personal assistant. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Sawir is taking on a bit more responsibility. Uh, not more responsibility, you know, look, he's the owner of the, he's the, owner of the football club. Um, responsibility is the, yeah, <laughs> responsibility is the wrong word. Just been a little bit more hands-on in terms of, um, you know, the football decisions. And, um, and then Chris Heck, the the head of biz, uh, head uh, president of business, uh, God, you can tell I'm on holiday here. Yeah, on that note, president of business operations, um, as we know um, from the story that I broke last month, has has come in um, and will be overseeing now all decisions off the field. So, in short, Christian Perslow is somebody who is a very all in character you know it's something a term that we 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 hear a lot in football now um if you look back to when he came in in the summer of 2018 the only reason he joined a a championship club which Villa were at the time as the CEO was because he had the opportunity to invest in the club and became a minority investor um and and then obviously had a very very uh, important role at the club but in these more recent times with the change of model, uh, model um, he wasn't willing to take a slightly diminished role. And look, he was offered the opportunity to stay at the club and, and help um, uh, you know, continue moving the club forward. But he didn't want that. Um, you know, there's not really the need for a CEO anymore. So he wouldn't have been a CEO. Um, he'd have been slightly diminished role. So, yeah, times are changing. It would have been difficult for him to go from doing being across everything yeah. to it being diminished. I can understand why he, did, why he didn't really want, want to do that. Like you say, his character as well. He... I don't mean it's nastily. He likes to be at, at the forefront in a in, in, yeah, a, lot, in, yeah, a, in yeah. a lot of areas, doesn't he? So you know, yeah, he, wouldn't, I, he wouldn't have liked that. He wouldn't have enjoyed it. Yeah, and, and I don't think it's a nasty thing to say. I think it, it's accurate. You know, he Christian uh, Perslow had time at um, Liverpool and, and Chelsea previously. the The role at Chelsea didn't really you know tick all the boxes that he wanted. He wanted to have the high profile role where he was in charge of you know, the big decisions at football clubs. And he got that at Aston Villa and he had, and he, he's done a very, very good job. That you know, We'll probably go through it now, some of the highs and, and, and the few lows. Um, but in general, you know, you look at where Villa were when he came, a mid-table championship club, and where he uh, where Villa are when he leaves. Villa in Europe, seventh, uh, just finished the seventh, 
place, finishing the Premier League. Um, and almost every department at the football club is stronger now. And that's partly because of his direction and uh, the role that he's played alongside the two owners. Yeah, look, I, I think he has, there's no denying he's done some really positive stuff for Villa and he's done done some good stuff. There's, there's a few things in recent history that I've not particularly liked, as I'm speaking as a, as a fan here. There's things he's done and there's things he's said, he's said that I've, I've not really agreed with, but I can't deny what you've just said there. That <coughs> in, in the five years, you know, he said he wanted Villa to be in Europe within five years. They've just they've only just done it, but they you know mm. and a lot of that is to do with the manager that they've managed to hire. But it feels like in in some ways Emery coming in for him that's the the beginning of the end in in a couple of ways because the Gerard appointment was a disaster. But look, clubs will make bad managerial hires. It happens all the time. He's not the only CEO that will be guilty of that in football history. It's happened countless times. So you can probably forgive that. I do think they held on to him too long. Again, I'm speaking as a fan here. From my point of view, I think I think they held on to Gerard too long. And possibly if it had been up to Perzo, they maybe would have even given him another one or two games b- before he was dismissed. But Emery coming in, the job he's done has been absolutely in- incredible. But because of all the things that Emery's been promised and the, the control that Emery wants and probably wanted to end up taking the job in the first place, that is what, that what's seen him out, really, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, Emery's now, other than the other than the owners, the most powerful person at the football club. He is making all the footballing decisions and it's just a change in style, you know give all the power to the manager to to deal with the football uh, side of things and um you know have somebody else to deal with the off field matters so what what you've now got at villa is a manager who was hired by Suiris to do all the football things and Suiris now taking a more hands on role and you've got a head of uh, president of business operations dealing with all the off field matters like globalizing villa taking you know in, increase giving taking the brand into different you know, areas, in, increasing revenue, um, working on the commercial structure. You've now got a guy in Chris Heck who was hired by Wes Edens. So there's four really powerful people there that are working together to take Villa forward. Um, and with that in mind, Christian Perslow's role as CEO, which has been an all-encompassing role for the last five years, is no longer really valid. Is that, isn't that a bit strange, though? I can't, I can't think of many football clubs, or especially Premier League terms I'm talking here. I can't think of a Premier League team without a CEO. You might know more than me if there is one, but is there, is that, that's not normal, is it? That's not a normal I mean, way of operating, is it, let's say? But I'm all for it. it, it I'm all for it because it's unique. It's a, North American, it's a very North American model, isn't it, that Villa have sort of adopted now. It's what uh, you know, probably Wes would have seen more often. Um, in in the the circles that he sort of knocks around him, but the uh, way you just called him Wes, as if like, you've been <laughs> hanging around for years, you and you and Wes, <laughs> you're on holiday with you. <laughs> it, 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 um, look, it's um, it's from conversations you have, isn't it? And obviously, people inside the club know him as Wes. So uh, yeah, maybe I should be more <laughs> more professional. More professional there, Greg. You're supposed <laughs> to be the professional one of the two of us. <laughs> I know, getting a bit carried away. Here. Um, but yeah, look, you know, I haven't gone through all the Premier League clubs. I can't think of the structures because I don't deal with them day to day, you know, so I don't know the, the, the full de- the full structure without going through them all. But, um, you know, Villa are very confident in what they've got going forward. They've obviously had five very successful years under this model. Um, and, and look, you know, the, the question now is whether that they can improve and, and take the club forward because that's the most important thing now. Villa have been on a, on any, on a, on a upwards trajectory for five seasons. Um, can they continue it? Yeah, I think completely forgot what I was going to say, which is great when you're doing doing a, doing a live podcast. I think he goes. It's all. My, I find it difficult to give him the credit for the for what's happened on the football pitch in the in the season that's just gone. Because, like I say, it wasn't his decision to sack Gerard. Emery wasn't his appointment. So I say we we talk. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. We talk about leaving him him leaving Villa in, in a European place and in, 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 a, in a great space. But really, the last since, since October, how much of that has been to do with him? I think when you have a successful football club, you have to look at all the departments and you've got to look at Villa's playing staff to start with because it's only natural to say that Emery has completely changed everything and Emery has uh, inspired the change in, in Villa's sort of position uh, in the Premier League and a lot of that I think is fair to say but 
Emery, as I've said on so many podcasts, Emery couldn't have done this with any bunch of players, right? So this this team and this club almost has been built over five seasons. You look at the, yeah. the squad, you know, John McGinn was a player that came in even before Christian Persler. Um, and you look at some of the players, obviously Persler was part of the, the hiring process to get the likes of Tyro Mings in, um, Ezri Konza, well, every single every single yeah, player at the club except for Alex Moreno um, and, and John Durant. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a team effort to get it done. Yes, Emery's put the... the um, um, the style of playing that has helped Villa increase uh, improve results, but the team has been built over a very long time, and it's not just the first team that you can look at. You know, you look at the women's team, for example. Oh, they yeah, were they were a player. second tier yeah. team who have had that in real clear investment and plan, and Perslow was a big part of that. The academy, obviously, um, he's helped, um, and I just think there are a lot of success stories over the last five years, and what Villa have probably needed just to pull it all together. He's an elite coach and they've got that now. So, uh, OK, it wasn't his decision to bring in um, Emery. It was it was something that was pushed by Suarez after after Stephen Gerrard was sacked. But, you know, Villa just need, that's just one element, the fact that they've got the manager in there. You need the team, you need the support, yeah. you need everything around it. And that's been built over a good few years now. So, um, you know, maybe we could look at a percentage split and he's certainly got a percentage just to, to, um, to play in it. Yeah, I think that's fair. <clears throat> David Styles has just said in the comments, it seems too binary to say that Perslow's groundwork hasn't had an impact throughout the whole of his tenure. I, I, that wasn't what I was trying to say. I probably didn't explain it very well. But I think that's probably a fair way fair way of, of looking at it. Maybe that Villa wouldn't have been as attractive to Emery had a lot of the stuff that Perslow had been involved in not, not happened. So I think that's a really good yeah. way to put it. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, two years ago, Emery turned down... Um, uh, the, the move to Newcastle United, didn't they? Mm. Decided to stay at Sevilla, uh, at Villarreal uh, because they were on the Champions League adventure. Villa at that point wouldn't have been able to to bring him in. You know, a year further down the line, having established themselves further in the in the Premier League, having got the likes of uh, Diego Carlos, Bubakar Kamara in, signed some of the other players down to longer term deals. You know, re- really established themselves for an extra year in the Premier League. Just became a slightly more uh, attractive club to join and all that hard work that had been done previously made Emery realise that Villa are a good project, Villa are a project that he wanted to be a part of. Yeah, I don't know whether you'd be able to even answer this question because there's probably legal issues and stuff involved in it, but how does it work with him? Obviously he came in and took on a percentage of, of, of the ownership of the club, didn't he? So now he's leaving, I assume that has dissolved with him, I would assume. I mean, look at the statement, don't you? Uh, the, the, the official statement said Christian Perslow has left his position as CEO and director. So, okay, so. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, so, so that's gone. Ultimately, there's a lot of recency bias in football. I think, unfortunately, for Christian Perslow, I think he'll be remembered for the Gerard, Gerard debacle just because that's something that, that that's happened more, more recently. And it, look, it, as I said, it was it was a mistake, but clubs hire managers that don't work all the time. But ultimately, I think that's. It's, you're saying though he's been offered, he was offered to, to stay on. So just, let's say, let's say this again. I'm trying to work out what I'm trying to say here. Did the Gerard was the Gerard thing that the end of him. Do you think? Well, yes and no because there was no major bust up or falling out or anything. But when Gerard was sacked, so where he took on a great, it took on a more of a hands-on role and decided to push to get Emery in. And since then, the whole direction and the model of the club has changed. So yeah. almost by consequence, yes, that's a good things have changed. Yeah. Yeah, that makes, so. that makes sense. Look, like I say, he's done some good, he's done some bad, he did some things towards the end of his tenure, said something. It was more stuff he said that I didn't really like at the, at the end of his tenure. I, I didn't like that interview with Beth Rigby on Sky News at all. I thought it was com- completely unnecessary. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure why he did that. I didn't like some of the wording around season ticket raises, but then that, you know, it comes from him, but it might not have been him that, that, that worded it. But I think overall, I think the main way you can look at it is that, you know, five years ago, Villa was struggling in, in the championship. Championship, It was looking pretty bleak. He leaves and Villa are in a, in, in a much better place. It'd be, look, I don't think he'll stay away from football. I think mm-hmm. you'll, see, you'll see him d- d- doing something. Even in that Beth Rigby interview, I kind of got 
the feeling that he was laying down the groundwork for a, for a work in, in in football in a wider scale rather than maybe being at, being at one team. But it's we'll interesting, see. yeah. I mean, it, it, it is interesting to see what he would do next. I mean, I, I just rewind back to five years ago when you know, almost five years ago when he joined. Um, I spoke to him at length on his first day, and you know, he was saying he had planned to to go to lots of different places in mm. the world with his wife and go and visit um, some of their favourite cities. Um, and, and look, the appeal of coming to a championship club as a CEO at that point, it, it just wasn't there. Um, and he was almost talking, uh, I mean, he was almost talking as if he was ready to retire at that point. And that was five years ago. Now, he's, he's had a couple of, well, he's had, he's had three really important roles at football clubs. And I feel like he got everything that he needed out of this one. I know privately that he, it, it felt very rewarding for him when he spoke to supporters um, and he talked about you know some of the good things that that happened at Villa as you know part of um, his his time at the club. And look, this is a guy who's had so much success in business, but having that sort of high profile status in football, um, he, you know, really liked that. And yeah, you could tell. And and look, you know, that's what happens. We sometimes with really wealthy, successful businessmen, um, they tick off that box and they want something else. Then um, you know successful people that's typically what happens also um so we got that you know whether he will whether we'll see him in football again um don't know whether he'll get an opportunity like villas again and and be able to go on a journey like that or get something as as high profile remains to be seen but what's very clear is that you know he's he's a very very good operator and he's helped villa a lot um yeah there'll be people who have other things to say about him good and bad but in general he's you know done the job that was required Obviously, he was the the kind of the face of of the club. So at Premier League meetings, he'd be the person that would attend attend those meetings. You know, when Villa sold Grealish and brought the three players in, it's him talking about that. That's kind of gone now because it's Emery is is the, is the football side. So I mean, you might not, you probably in fact don't know this <clears> at this point. But Premier League meetings, for example, people or Villa fans will want to know who will be our voice at, at those meetings. Now, do we do we know that yet? Yeah, it would be interesting to see because you know Perslow was a very uh, vocal voice in those Premier League meetings. He always fought hard for Villa. Um, you know, Villa were one of the other fourteen, weren't they? When the when the top six were sort of fighting for other things, and, and Perslow would always try and try and fight for the other fourteen. Um, he was very passionate about trying to make Villa big again. And I think supporters like that. You know, when, whenever you listen to him speak, he was always trying to big up Villa about how big they are and about how much he wanted to take them forward. Um, I presume it'll be Chris Heck now because he will be dealing with all the off-field matters, um, you know, dealing with stadium expansions and, and globalising Villa. So, uh, yeah, it's very early days, obviously. We're, we're yeah. sort of 12 hours into Perslow's exit, so still trying to answer some of the uh, get some of the questions answered, but I presume it will be him moving moving Villa forward. I mean, he's worked in football before, so he's worked for the the New York Red Bulls. He's, he's mm. worked with Short doing period, similar kind yeah. of things, yeah. I, I would presume at, at, at New York Red Bulls. But you can't. I'm not, I'm not saying you need Premier League experience to come in and, and do jobs, but I imagine in a Premier League meeting, not having that experience would be a little bit of a disadvantage. So it would be interesting to see. What, what happens with that and, and, and how it goes. Look, again, that's something I can't deny, having Perslow fight in your corner in those kind of meetings. He's a voice that's going to get heard. He's going to get his opinion across that. Yeah. That, yeah. That's how he is. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. lots of people described him as, you know, tenacious and um, sort of very, he was very, very hard working. You know, I, I didn't have a very close relationship with him. You know, I don't think any reporter did. He was very keen on... Um, keeping the media out the loop in terms of transfers and, and you know key decisions at the football club. I think what we've what you know what we've seen over the last couple of years is Villa trying to announce transfers um uh you know uh, themselves breaking sort of those exclusive stories them, themselves. That's what Perzo really was keen on. Um it became almost a bit of an obsession trying to keep the the stories out, which I don't think was too healthy um you know for for, for people close to that. But um, yeah, you know, Villa are moving forward. Obviously, the, the the big talking point today as well that we haven't touched on is, is Monche at, at Sevilla. Um, you know, Unai, Unai Emery's worked with him previously um, in in Spain and wants to bring him in. You know, Villa are quite far down the line, but it is quite com- it is still complicated. We don't know for sure if if Monche is leaving Sevilla yet. There are there are plans um, 
you know, at the at the Europa uh, Europa League winners have have put in a lot of groundwork with signings already, and that's part of Monchi's um, plan. So we'll see whether he fancies coming to England for for the first time ever, um, and we'll see what he's made of. You know, he's, he's, it's been been a long time, hasn't it, since he's been in football, and look, he's got an incredible history of of signing players and selling them on for more. Um, but he started 23 years ago and a, and a lot's changed in, in recruitment and data science and analysis and scouting now. Does he still have that magic to, to get ahead of everyone else? Let's see. You know, Obviously, Emery thinks he has and, and Emery wants to work with him. Um, I think key is having a really experienced operator alongside him. I don't think Villa are in that position where they typically need to go and find gems for £2 million and sell them for £30 million. It helps. <laughs> but Yeah. But, like, you know, Villa are in a new level now. They want to go and buy players that are already ready as well. So um, having that experienced operator is what's appealing. Yeah, well, I've done some reading up on Munch and I think his first spell at Sevilla, he was very good at pulling in players who were at the, the peak of their power, so players maybe between the ages of, of 25 and 29, getting those players in that, that were ready. I think where he struggled at Roma was that wasn't the room. He was trying to get players in who were up and coming and you make them <clears> stars and sell, sell them on. And he didn't have a great, a great success with that method. And I think the second time around at Sevilla as well, it's, it's been a little bit like, like that as well. So the spell where he's had great success, he's doing the work exactly as you've described, getting players in at their peak who are ready to come and play. And I, th- like, I think that's what Villa will be doing in his transfer. When you can see with the signing of Tillemans already, they're 26 years old, someone who's played in the Premier League before, someone that's played in Europe, played a lot of games for his country. They're bringing in a player that doesn't really need any adaptation. They're not going to be looking to sell him on in four years' time for, for, for a huge profit. That's that's not the way that they're, that they're working with, with Tillemans. I always think you need kind of a little bit of sprinkle of everything when yeah. you do when you're doing transfer activity. And I'm sure Villa will will go that route. But he's worked with Emery before. Bit of Garni's there to, to help as well. Langer, it sounds like will will we'll still be there as well. So there's a lot of people who've been at Villa and worked with Emery for either six months or six years or or whatever. There's you know, feels like the right balance. Just just don't let him come to Birmingham before he signed a con- <laughs> signs a contract because Alan Manny came to Birmingham and he couldn't have run away any quicker. Good, good. So don't let him, don't let him come to Birmingham and maybe maybe we'll get this over the line. Yeah, and I think look, that's probably why Villa have been a little bit coy with this and they've just have been a little bit quieter with their uh, with their briefings. Um, you know, the the Alan Manny, uh, scenario didn't play out too well for them, did it? Uh, you know, look, it was clear that that that's the that's the guy they wanted. You know, they came very close to getting him, but. As we were talking about at the time, you know, for Villa to have been able to get some money from Barcelona, you know, a key decision maker from Barcelona, that was a, a huge statement if they could have got that done. So it was always difficult. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, he decided to stay at, at Barcelona and Villa had to look elsewhere. With uh, with Monchi, Villa, you know, Emery knows him well. So um, <laughs> anybody, I always felt like everybody, anybody who was coming in next was always going to be a sort of sloppy second. But, uh, you know, Monchi's has an incredible reputation, so I don't think he'll feel that way if the deal gets done. He feels a more attainable target than Alemani to me. I mean, I yeah, like yeah, no, but look, you know, he, he has a huge, he has huge, huge power at Sevilla as well. You know, will he get that much power at Villa? You know, he makes all the key decisions there, and um, you know, they don't want him to leave either, so they're not going to make. No. It. I don't think they'll be making it easy for Villa. No, I mean, I texted you earlier saying, just been doing some reading on Monchi, and when he was at Roma, he sold Alisson to Liverpool for 75 million, and the replacement keeper for Roma was Robin Olsen. <laughs> that was that was one bit of his, his transfer business that, that he did. I'm not sure whether Olsen will be at, at, at Villa next season, but yeah, that I read that and thought, ooh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, good. That was an interesting Cla- replacement. Glad Emi Martinez is still on board. That's all I'm going to say. Aren't yeah. I? Yeah. Yeah. Emi Martinez still here. But I read, I read that earlier. There was a little bit of a, of a villa flavour to, to that bit of, tra- bit of transfer business. But I read that and I've got to say, I looked at the record at Rome and it, it was pretty mixed in all honesty. But Sevilla, he's done a lot of good work and that's where he's built up his reputation. Let's talk a little bit about Tillemans. Not going to keep you ages because you, you're on holiday. Let's talk about Tillemans. Then you, well, there was David Ornstein, wasn't it? That was the, was the first to break it on the athletic saying that, that Tillemans was, was coming in and then very quickly after that Villa announced that it that, that it was done but good scoop from from David Ornstein one of the best operators out there of course working for the for, for the athletic and what do you think of this I've made my feelings clear to be fair on social media what, what are your feelings on it uh, yeah I think it's a 
really clever signing. Um, yeah, a great, a great scoop from my, from my colleague David. Um, you know, it's just so good at breaking transfer stories, isn't it? Um, you know, the the real go to guy alongside his phone must be a joke. Oh yeah, God, I've seen him on deadline day and in action, and it's just uh, it's very stressful. I, I thought it was hard working, um, uh, putting in the time in when I'm supposed to be on holiday with my wife on the beach. But I think he's like that every day. <laughs> so uh, he has no day. He has no days off. No, 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 no days off. Day. I presume he doesn't have much sleep either. But um, yeah, lovely guy and 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 works really well and has given me a lot of guidance. So. Great to be on the same team as him. But yeah, Tielemans, I think it's a really clever signing for Villa. Uh, somebody who Emery pushed spe- spe- specifically. Um, the fact, yeah, gave him a massive contract, let's be honest. Um, uh, and AS Roma and AC Milan were both interested. But the project at Villa was what appealed the most. I think working with Emery really appealed for t- uh, to Tielemans as well. Um, you know, any speak to any Leicester fan and they'll say, if you put Tielemans in a possession based team and just allow him to do the passing and breaking the lines and, and doing the creative stuff, he's gonna be excellent. I think the the one sort of negative or sort of disadvantage to, to his game is that physically he isn't sort of um, you know, up there as as some of the other midfielders, but He's not the most mobile. Yeah, either. and and you know, has he got the engine sort of as as similar to, to a John McGinn? I don't think so, but um, his qualities, I think, will fit perfectly into this Villa team. And what Villa now have is, you know, five, maybe six, if you include Dendonka, you know, real um, trusted, reliable options in midfield. Um, and I think that that appealed. Great deal, free signing. Yeah, huge wages, but uh, Nassif Swiris and Wes, Wes Edens are prepared to relax that, that wage structure a little bit now to get better players in through the door. Yeah, I just went on on Talk Sport and I was asked about about Tillemans and it's great to have a high quality like option who's good on the ball in central midfield. So like, he's got a job to get into the team with Louise and and Kamara. I think that's a really high level partnership for those two playing as two sixes together. Maybe Louise a bit more as an eight at times. So he's got a job to get into Villa's best eleven. But hopefully Villa will have so many games that you know he's bound to get plenty of football. He's good at he's good at set pieces as well. Villa don't have much European experience in the squad. He's played in Europe. He's played a lot of games for Belgium as well. And he's played in the Premier League. So, you know, I think from that point of view, it's it's a really good sign. I think Villa's midfield has gone from its weakest position, sorry, its weakest area of the team to probably the, the strongest now when you when you when you look at the players that they've got available there and the form that they've showed under Emery. And I think that's that's the most important thing is that Tillemans maybe lost his way at Leicester in the last year or so. But Leicester have been a club massively on the decline and probably only Madison can look themselves in, in the mirror there and say, oh, I did all I could. Tillemans will know he didn't have a good season last time round, but there was plenty of Aston Villa players who weren't having a good season mm. before Emery came in. Emery improves players. If you put Tillemans in a defined system and tell him exactly what he needs to do, he'll do it to a, to a high standard. Yeah. And I think the refresh will do him good as well because he'd, he'd been at Leicester four or five years now. I think, I think it's a really good signing, especially on a free. Look, I know it still costs money and the wages will be inflated, but for a free transfer, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's a, it's a great deal. Um, and, you know, I think that the, one of the other bonuses is, is that he's not going to need much time to settle in. He knows the speed of the Premier League. He knows the opponents he's faced previously. He's been in the, he played five seasons for Leicester now. He's just gonna, and he's got the, the entire pre-season to get, um, to get himself used to Villa's playing style, his new, his new teammates, etc. And Villa have got a lovely blend in midfield now. I think... You know some real success stories in there. John McGinn, one of the bargains, you know, of the century, uh, for two for two million. Bubakar Kamara, a player that Villa pushed really hard for and worked, you know, really hard on the data side of things to identify him and why he was the best fit for Villa. Um, Stephen Gerrard was the guy who obviously pushed really hard at the very end to to get him through the door um, and played his part there. Uh, Douglas Louise, a player that's you know one of the longest serving players now at Villa, bizarrely. Um, and uh, you know, Perslo did the, did the hard work to, to get him to sign uh, an extension. One of the sort of last footballing decisions he made, actually. So if that's one of the legacies he leaves, then fantastic. And, and obviously Jacob Ramsey. Well, you make it, you said, oh sorry, uh, Louis, Louis, sorry, yeah, the, the, yeah, the so, contract yeah. extension, yeah, not yeah, yeah, sure. um, yeah, that was they did well to do that. And uh, and Jacob Ramsey, you know, somebody who's a player who's the the, the poster boy almost for um, for youth development at the club now, following Jack Grealish's exit. So, yeah. Really, uh, really lovely blending midfield, um, and uh, and yeah, Villa are moving forward. Yeah. 
I mean, the five midfielders you've mentioned there, Villa have put those five players together in midfield for around seventeen and a half million for the five of them in transfer fees. Like that is that that's some business. And don't, don't get me wrong, Villa have wasted an awful lot of money at various points over yeah. over the last five years. But to get that midfield together now, it's taken Emery to come in and, and get it all together. But having those five there and seventeen and a half million, that's mm. incredible. That that's great. That's the kind of transfer success that I've been envious of other teams having in in the past. I look at that now as a, as a Villa fan and think. We've done really well there. Quick word before you go, then. Any other transfer gossip that you can give us, Greg? Everyone's been waiting. Yeah, for sorry, don't anything. know at this moment in time. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't had any haven't had many calls on that over the last couple of days. I've been switched off a little bit, so I'll try and update some more next week. But we'll do another show next week when I'm back at home. I'm more focused um, and my wife isn't hiding under this bed. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's get your wife from from under the bed then. Let's, let's end the show. Greg, thank you very much for ju- for jumping on with me tonight. It's 473 of you here watching at the moment. Thanks ever so much to every single one of you for watching and those that will go on and watch the video as well. We'll be doing 1874s th- throughout the summer. There hasn't been a video for a week or so, but yeah, busy lives and, and, and things going on. So but we're going to aim to try and do, do one a week if we can to, to go through things. So thanks to Greg for interrupting his holiday to come on and chat with me. Thanks to everyone that's watched. Thanks for Adam for throwing the show together last minute as our producer. And yeah, have a good rest of the evening and we will speak soon up the villa. <laughs>